Good morning and welcome to the third of three webinars showing the saltwater opportunities in the magnificent Pacific Ocean in our backyards. In this, the third and final, we will be covering day trips out of Oxnard to the Channel Islands. But first a word of thanks to our hosts, the Southwest Council of Fly Fishers International for creating this series and promoting the webinar. They do a lot to promote the sport in the local area and it would be a good idea to join up with these guys. Let's also thank Fisherman's Spot and Van Nuys for their sponsorship of this event. They have a expen extensive, I was gonna say extent, expensive stock, extensive stock of all the gear you'll see mentioned in the coming presentations. As a bonus, Dave Schaefer is a veteran and host of many guided shop trips. So give them a call and ask for Dave. First, a little housekeeping. This is a webinar, not a regular Zoom meeting, so you won't all get to see each other. But um, I know that many of you all have questions for Michael at the end, and you can type these in anytime via the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. There'll be plenty of time to ask and answer all your questions later. Um, if you're new to Zoom, at the top right is a button that can change your view. We recommend gallery view, and you can also adjust the side-to-side -side size of the presentation. Okay, so today we will be talking to Michael Schweit, who is a, probably a familiar face to many of you, about the least expensive and most accessible of all the trips that we've covered in the last three Saturdays. Um, this would be a day charter to the Channel Islands, leaving usually out of Oxnard. Michael has been fishing since he was eight years old. And back in the photo there, I see he's got his 80s hair and 80s shades on. He caught his first wild trout on the Kern, and it slipped out of his hands back into the river, ma making him a, a, a dedicated catch and release fisherman for the rest of his life. He's been fly fishing since 1984, and he took up the saltwater when um, he met Lefty Cray at a club meeting and asked Lefty if it was possible to catch albacore on a fly. And of course, Lefty told him that yes, anything can be caught on a fly. So he's also dubbed a fly, fly angelist because he's always encouraging others to try our sport. He's been running charters and fly and conventional out of San Pedro and San Diego and to, to the Channel Islands since 1984. He's also, and I'm proud to, proud to announce this, he's also the current world record holder for white sea bass, uh, which is an 11 pound 13 ounce specimen on eight pound class tippet. So um, congratulations, Michael, that looks like there was not caught on the fly there, just a wild guess I'm saying, thinking there in your photograph. Yeah, I wish that was caught on the fly, Marshall. Thank you for uh, being here this morning. This, uh, yeah, this was uh, one of those weird times that we had out in the Catalina Channel when these gargantuan albacores showed up. And we went out there with, uh, probably maybe could have used a fly rod, but we were using conventional stuff. And this was my largest albacore I ever caught. It was a 41 pound fish. And it was the smallest one caught on the boat that day. This was a period of time that if you look at the record books, you'll see how many records were shattered for albacore in the San Pedro channel. So yeah, it was quite an interesting time. Wow, those were the days. Those were the days. So let's go on to the boat that we're going to be on, uh, on this kind of trip. We do this out of the Channel Islands, and the boat we use up there is the Island Tack. Um, and, and it's more really to me about the captains and the crews, because they know what they're doing. But uh, it's a good boat. Uh, it's been around for a long time under, uh, I think, this is my third ownership with this boat with, uh, with John. And uh, these, are, uh, these are not the luxurious um, sport fishing boats that you see on the multi-day trips. It's a fine boat, it's safe, it's got it's all those things. There's no galley, we have a microwave and the best coffee in the fleet, but uh, it works out pretty well. It's, uh, it gets us where we need to be and gets us there in comfort and uh, works out well. You can even sleep on the boat. We've got room, uh, we've got bunk room to sleep in. So uh, any of these things become available to us. So um, in the light of recent, um, well, the recent fire on the dive boat and the other COVID regulations. How, has that changed the, the way things are done on these boats now? 
Uh, it, it has to a degree uh, when you talk about the fire. I mean, we've always had like you can see the two fire extinguishers in the upper left hand corner. We've always had that. So, and there's a fire extinguisher outside and he's got a system down in the engine room, too. Um, that, that's always been there. Um, but COVID's changed things a lot. We used to go on the boat the night before, like, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night and everybody sleep in the bunk room and go out and with covid now we can't board the boat until four o'clock in the morning so you know we end up sleeping in our cars or driving up there in the middle of the night and they used to provide uh pillows and blankets and uh now it's bring your own sleeping bag bring your own pillow kind of thing and uh, you know and, and there we are but it, you know what it's a one-day trip we leave at four o'clock in the morning come back at four o'clock in the afternoon so it, it all works out and um, speaking specifically of COVID, we've got lots of ventilation in the, in the bunk room. And the interesting thing is with all the boats that go overnight trips from just one overnight to multi-day trips from uh, Santa Barbara down to San Diego, as far as I'm aware of, there have been uh, two positive cases, uh, one in San Diego and one in the Channel Islands through all of COVID. So it's kind of been the story that maybe the cure to COVID is actually going saltwater fishing. Oh, well, that wouldn't that be nice? Um, it, it's been rumored that you've been spotted sleeping in a deck chair up on the deck. Um, I'm sure that must be fun. Yeah, that's that's been my new thing is uh, just trying to keep everything safe at home is uh, to go on the trips. It's like, yeah, I understand nobody's caught it. But for my own personal thing, yeah, I've had a lounge chair and I sleep up on deck and uh, it's a little breezy on the way out. So we're looking forward to everybody getting their vaccines and uh, next year being back in the bunk room where you can hear everybody snoring and burping during the night. So it's all pretty good. <laughs> so this is uh, the Channel Islands are in the Channel Islands National Park. It's kind of a, a rare offshore area that uh, has been designated and, uh, and protected. And uh, there's five islands that we fish out there in the Channel Islands National Park. And uh, from Anacapa to Santa Cruz, and then the further out you go is Santa Rosa, and then San Miguel and way far out of there is Santa Barbara. Um, so, so does the captain just throw a dart at the dartboard and decide where to go or what, what, what criteria does he use? Well, he's pretty much what they're doing is, you know, they, they, things don't change that much up there. They go from things like the day before or a couple of, or talking to their other people that have gone out there and what's going on. We're typically fishing Anacapa and uh, uh, Santa Cruz Island. You know, here they are on the map. You can see them over here. Here's the landing. And out to Anacapa is about an hour and a half, a little over that. And then out to Santa Cruz is around two to two and a half hours. This whole area here, actually all around the islands, they're very, you can see down here, I tried to zoom in on Google and we couldn't get a good shot. But there are ridges and reefs all over these islands. And the fascinating thing to me is that we could be on a ridge one day and have it loaded with fish. And they'll tell me that the day before they were out there and there were absolutely no fish to be seen at all. So it really comes down to these guys. I think there's a hunch, there's a feeling, um, and it's their experience. And that's really, to me, more important than, than what the boat is. It's more about the captain and crew that, that make this really worthwhile. I forgot to ask you, how many crew do they have? I know they have the skipper and who else? Yeah, we go with two. Uh, the captain and skipper, whatever we want to call them, uh, is one, and then he's got a deckhand. And... Uh, uh, especially on a fly rod trip when there's only seven people for the two of them, they handle everything really well. But even with the conventional land fly, when we go with 11 people, they are, you know, you got one guy in the bait tank throwing some chum. The other two, if, if we get into a wide open bite or something, you know, they're out there ready to gaff fish and, and do whatever they need to do. They handle it really, really well. All right. Anyway, it's a really pretty thing. I mean, I've got some pictures here kind of showing you because I, I, I really do find this to be, you know, the, the fishing thing of, you know, well, we just go there to fish. But there's a lot of beauty that you can see on the way out there. And while you're fishing, this is, to me, the Channel Islands are one of the prettiest parts that we have of California, you know, with these kind of things. Wow, well, it's easy to, easy to forget this as you get focused on, you know, figuring out what you're going to cast and how you're going to do it. Just taking a moment to look at the natural beauty is something that's well worth doing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I know you like photography, so it's always kind of fun to go out there and play around. You get some really good lighting out there. So it's uh, some, some nice things. Um, you know, just we get the fog sometimes. Sometimes we're completely overcast, but here's one where the fog is breaking off. I do have this picture up here for another reason. See all these kelp beds out here. That's one of the reasons, uh, just like in a stream where you've got all the vegetation, which creates all the bug life, which gives you a lot of fish. 
in all of this is where you've got shelter for bait fish and for the things that the other game fish like to eat. So, you know, this is all over the island. There's kelp everywhere. Um, what this shows you, though, in an area like this is it's not real good to fish in this right now because kelp floats. And when the kelp's all on top like this, it means there's no current. And when there's no current, the fish have a tendency not to be as active and biting. They will eat, but they're certainly not going to be a good bite. So it's more that you're looking for places that, you know, the, the, when you see a lot less of this, and as you drive over it, you'll see the kelp down like, you know, four or five, 10 feet below the surface, but now there's current. And so now the fish are, are you know, are, are more apt to bite. There's a few blowholes around the island that come from just the geological processes that they have there and it forms these things. And when the waves come in, they blow into the air, but it's, it's just really, really nice. Another kind of unknown fact um, that maybe a lot of people don't know is there's a, a, a couple of pair, I think, uh, of bald eagles. There's one right here uh, in the center. They're, they're tagged. Um, they monitor these guys. But it's interesting because they know about the fishing boats and they've kind of uh, developed this relationship, I guess, with the fishing boats. Uh, they know what it means. They're not going to be like seagulls that are diving on our bait. And this guy was sitting up there on that rock when we took the picture and John, the captain said, here, watch this. And he took a, uh, a small rockfish that, had, that we had in the hole that, that, you know, that was dead and he threw it out there. And while the fish was in the air, that, that eagle left his perch and immediately came down and he made one big circle over the boat, kind of gauging, it was fascinating to watch, gauging where the wind and his angles and everything were coming from. And this is one pass and he came down nailed that thing and and off number 24 goes with his uh he had breakfast he was very happy went right back to that original picture that i showed you and had a nice breakfast up there so uh wow yeah, it's it's kind of like fun. having a like having a pet yeah in, in some ways so uh, yeah uh, that, you know it, it worked out it was kind of a nice thing to see um we do see whales out there it's pretty interesting um the channel has a, a fair amount of whales in there so it's not an uncommon occurrence to see that that looks a little choppy. Are you getting uh, getting a few people getting woozy on these boats? Um, you know, it's most of the chop, especially if you look back at this. That's an afternoon on the way back that we saw that I could tell by the lighting um, and a little bit of white caps. No, typically um, most of our wind is in the afternoon and it's at our backs coming. Uh, it's blowing uh, right behind us. And so it doesn't affect us on the way out. We may have a little bit of bump, as we call it, with a little bit of swell, but we've never had the captains are pretty conscious of this. If there's weather blowing, um, we're not going to go. You know, they're just not going to do it because the fishing's bad and it's uncomfortable. And and I'll show you that on the next slide after this. But this is why our season for us, you know, in terms of doing uh, even conventional fishing, they open up March 1st to rock fishing. So right now they're doing a lot of maintenance on the boats. But from March 1st until around November uh, is really the season up there. But winds have a great effect up there, greater than, uh, than further down south, and, and, uh, and I'll show you why with that. And you can see there's a list of all the different species that we have. And again, reiterating that we leave the landing at about four o'clock and we get back around four or five. Um, in, in looking at this from windy.com, this was uh, when we had just had a recent wind event, but it's kind of interesting because all this stuff out here, this is blowing at 25 or 30 knots. And it's generating, you know, six to eight to 10 foot swells out there. And it's uncomfortable and it's not unsafe and the boats can handle it, but it's just uncomfortable and very difficult to fish, you know, in those kind of conditions. But as you notice here, you can see this is the bite of California. But as you get farther in here, more to the east, it starts to block it off. And we've been out there on days where there is gale force warnings out here where, you know, there's, uh, you know, just really big seas. And we leave the landing and we might get a little bumpy on the way out, nothing serious, but we could fish, you know, back here on Anacapa. We could fish the backside of Santa Cruz. And on those days, we've had some, some really, really good fishing. So, you know, it's, it's just different. It's different than Catalina. Um, sometimes a little bit cooler in the water because of that, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a nice thing. But getting onto the fish, which everybody cares about, this is your California kelp bass, which is what we call calico bass. Um, my good friend, Jerry, that had caught this fish. Uh, they're just a, a real, they're like a bass, you know, they're pugnacious. They attack things. They, they're, they're not going to take you into your backing or anything, but they're certainly going to put up a fight. And even a 12 inch fish, you're kind of like, wow, this one's going to weigh pounds. And, and they don't. You know? <laughs> I have to, I have to ask you, there's, um, there's a, a lot of discussion about whether the uh, conventional guys fish, fishing live bait or plastics 
uh, get bigger size calicos than the fly guys. Is there any truth in this rumor? I think there still is. You know, here's a fly fish that I had. This was came out of popper. You know, this is, you know, uh, the keeper size up there by, by law, you know, but the, the, the limit is 14 inches. Um, so that's kind of how we grade fish is, you know, above that. Um, I would agree with you that, yeah, the conventional guys, especially I've seen plastics outfish bait. There's something about their, there's something we're still trying to figure out. You know, Vaughn last week showed a lot of flies that he's developed and that he's fishing uh, in that area around Catalina for the breakwater, but that's specific. I'm still trying to kind of unlock this secret to, to catching good sized fish out of the Channel Islands. I mean, we get them once in a while, it certainly happens, but I, I'd like to be able to know how to do it more consistently. But uh, here, here's a fish that ate a, a popper on a sinking line of all things. So, you know, they're aggressive, they'll eat things. This is, here's another species that gets everybody out of bed is the white sea bass. Um, they were not around the Channel Islands. I, like I said, I've been doing this for 35 some odd years and we would rarely, rarely catch these. And the state of California started a stocking program for white sea bass and uh, it has really taken hold. There's natural spawning that goes on. They are still actively spawning uh, hatchery fish out there and, and they do a survey program to see what's going on. But, you know, we have days like this doesn't happen all the time, but you know, you get out there and, uh, and, and, and these fish are, are going to bite. Uh, an interesting aside that I always tell people is uh, white sea bass are like couch potatoes. You know, some of these fish, the, the fish in this picture are probably all 15 to 25 pounds. They get up to 70 and 75 pounds and they get that way by being couch potatoes. They're big squid eaters. And especially around the Channel Islands or Catalina or any place that they've got squid beds the sea bass sit around and wait at the edge of the squid beds. And when the squid spawn, they die. And the couch potatoes or the white sea bass in this case, go over and nibble on the dead, the ones that they don't have to you know, go chasing down. So if you're fishing live bait with squid, one of the things they, you'll watch guys do that know what they're doing is they'll take a live squid and, and, and smash them against the deck to stun them or kill them because that's what the white sea bass want. They want something casual. So for us as fly anglers, if you're fishing for them, you know, we're going to do a slow strip. You're not going to be ripping that thing through the water. And, you know, on this day with John, we were out there um, and uh, John chased this school for two hours and they wouldn't eat, wouldn't eat. And John finally said, you know, we'll make one more drop and, and we'll see what happens. And the next drop, everybody went bendo. I got my fly came tight and I landed this fish. And after we took the photo, this is the first fish that I first legal uh, over the size limit that I had ever caught on, on a fly, John said, you know, the fish are still biting. And it's like, oh yeah, they are. And I went up to the bow and, you know, all, all off the bow, I got, you know, a full limit that day. And that's never happened since. So. It, well, and there's, there's two other amazing things. The first would be John's incredible weight loss. And the second that you're actually wearing a shirt that does not have a fish print on it. Uh, so yeah. th these are the two uh, personal personal remarks that I would like to make. Yes. About and, and I think there's a picture of John later on in the program. He shed about a hundred pounds, um, you know, which is good for him and good for his health. And we want to keep him around and his son's kind of following in his footsteps, not in weight, but in, in uh, skillfulness. So right. good guys, good guys to be fishing with. Mm -hmm. So we get Barracuda up there. Um, you know, this is a pretty small one. I think this was, I think Pedro was out there. This was his first saltwater trip and I think his first fish that he got, but it was pretty cool. Um, I think the size of it's like 22 or 28 inches. We, they're edible, but we, a lot of them, we let go, whether, you know, especially if they're short. Um, here's a larger one uh, in terms of those. So, uh, and these are around, you know, kind of on and off throughout the year. So we can get into a real good bite with these guys. Yep. All you need is a green clouser, right? The chartreuse, that's all what they seem to like. They love that. They also seem to like blue and white. Um, and, and one of the things is we don't always, you know, I know with Barracuda, with conventional, sometimes they'll use like a steel leader in, in these. But you can see in this case, like this one got it, you know, right right at the, at the lip. And, and uh, I'm not sure if Ron was using wire with this one, but it's most of the time we get them in the front of the mouth and so they don't bite through. Um, and uh, it works out okay. Another species that we love, if you're a fly rotter, you, you want these. These are bonita, and these go anywhere from two pounds up to five, seven pounds. And on the fly rod, they eat flies. They don't care. They're just, they're extremely aggressive. And Stuart here got one right off the bow, just kind of make it a flip cast and boom, got the fish. And they can run you around the boat. Um, just a really, really good sporting fish. 
and so yeah we love having these things around this is another fish that gets people going our california yellowtail and you know we've showed them uh two weeks ago with bruce down in san diego and we're fishing these guys off kelp patties and and vaughn really targets them out of catalina we get them out at the channel islands a lot um the problem with the channel islands is there's a lot of kelp like we were talking about before and Yellowtail are amongst the smartest fish that I have ever fished for. When you hook them, whether it's in the ocean or, or uh, when I say the, we're obviously in the ocean, but in the open ocean, like with Bruce or here where you're near the island, it's amazing that you hook these guys. And the first thing they do is go tearing off for the nearest rock formation or the nearest kelp paddy or the nearest forest of kelp to wrap you around and break you off. And this guy here, I think they were fishing that day with 30 and 40 pound test line to try to stop these fish. These were, all, these were all 25 to 40 pound fish. And I've hooked a couple of them on the fly and it's just amazing to watch your line just rip off your reel and you have absolutely no chance at all unless the guy gets lucky and turns out to sea. But it hasn't yeah. happened for me yet. Yeah, they know that they could become sushi at any moment and yes. they're out, out of there. Yes, and very good sushi. So they're completely mm -hmm. aware of that. This is a new species for me and a new for a, a few other people. This is starting to show up there. There's no uh, research on it or anything. This is a sandico. It's a cross between a sand bass and a calico bass. Um, it's got the, the shape and, and some of the markings of a calico bass, but the coloration is definitely more of a, of a sand bass. They're under the same regulations uh, as the calico bass in terms of size and how many you're allowed to keep. Um, and uh, in terms of taste, they're a little bit, you know, similar to spotted owl or, uh, you know, anything like that. that, that you might want to have. <laughs> but, but, bald, uh, bald eagle. Probably. Yeah, very similar. It could be a bald eagle. Yeah, so kind of similar. Um, and this is really, I would love to get these on the fly. You know, we get them incidentally uh, on bait. Uh, there's areas you can go drift and we've drifted it with the flies trying to get a halibut. And we have gotten them occasionally, but I've never gotten one. I've caught halibut in the surf, and this is a fish that, yeah, I would totally love to, to get this thing and, and make that happen. Um, but so, yeah, maybe someday we'll, we'll get a chance to figure that one out, too. Yeah. We also have whitefish, um, kind of an underrated fish. I think it's classified as a rockfish. They're not real aggressive on flies, and then all of a sudden when they turn aggressive, they are just delightful to catch. I, th I think these fight as hard as a uh, bonita. Um, they're, they're just really cool and very tasty, but a lot of fun to catch. And uh, we actually, I'll show you some pictures later on in this that we had last year uh, uh, in November when the water cooled down. That's what they look a little bit like a, like a saltwater grayling. You know, they've got that kind of look yeah, to them. Yeah. They're, they're, and they're, these guys get big. Yeah. They get up to like five or six pounds. And the five or six pounders, when we've caught them on eight weights, uh, you're not going to just land that fish. It's like really doing its thing. It looks like every every fish you catch is getting caught on a on a chartreuse clouser. That's, um, just a, that's just a coincidence, I think. Could be a coincidence, but you know, when we look at the bait, you'll see everything up there is kind of green and olive, so that that's going to happen. Um, this was not caught on the fly, but this is a sheep's head, and we have these around the Channel Islands. And I have caught sheep's head on the fly, as have other as have others. Um, they. Uh, you see by the big teeth on these things, they go in and they, they chew on the, the reefs and get all their, their food out of there. And um, kind of a fun fish. They get really, really big. So if we could ever figure out that one on the fly, that'd be another one to, to get. But you never stick your finger in the mouth of this thing to release it, ever. Um, Mike Forrest here shows us that, you know, even with flies, we can catch birds. Um, one, one of the easiest things to do if you're not careful. So, uh, but we always release the birds. Speaking of um, of uh, other creatures that get in the way, um, is this are, are there still seals that that hover around and wait for free meals when you catch them? The seals are there. The seals have always been there. Um, it's an interesting thing about seals because yeah, sometimes I, I've been at Catalina. I've had seals actually shut off a bite at Catalina. Um, where, where we could not stay, you know, you, you, they just wouldn't leave us alone. And the seals will follow a boat for quite a distance. Uh, in fact, one time we were fishing with Vaughn and we had a seal that just would not leave us alone. And so Vaughn actually turned and went offshore for about a mile and then came back to, to get the seal away. Down around the Channel Islands, they, they seem to be a little bit lazier as that we get them and they'll hang around the boat. They don't really, they kind of bug the fish, but we've caught fish when seals around the boat, but occasionally they get a little more aggressive and they'll take a fish off your line. 
in the very bad old days, I remember early early eighties, I saw a, a seal uh, shot with a twenty two rifle by the skipper, but that was in the um, that was in the the, the, the before pr politically correct days. Yes, they would still like to be doing that if they could, but um, there seems to be more of a truce you now going on between us and the seals, so it doesn't seem to make them. We we figured out how to make things work. So we're going on this trip, you know, explain to you all the things that are going on. And I, I don't know if Yvonne went over pretty well for those of you who saw his program last week about, you know, the different rods and things as to what we do out there. So I'm not going to show you rods or things, but I will tell you this. Um, we can fish as light as a seven weight if you're doing stern fishing. And I'm going to show you what that means later on. Uh, but the heavier rods, I actually fish a 10 or an 11 weight rod. And these fish don't really require a 10 or 11 weight unless you hook one of those big yellows, then you want that 10 or 11 weight rod. But on the boat, the trips that I'm on, which is, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, is if you're fishing at the bow, if the other guys are conventional fishing at the stern, you're going to be relegated to the bow. You can't fish at the stern with these guys. Not that they wouldn't let you, but with the back cast, you're going to tangle up everybody and it's just going to be a mess. So if you're up at the bow, you're casting over the boat, not to the side of the boat. And if you're throwing a clouser fly with, you know, this higher railing, the heavier rod makes it easier to get that fly up a little bit higher and, and keep it away from you and the boat. Typically, I'm using 300, 600 grain lines. I use shooting heads, but you can use the integrated lines that are uh, tied in with your uh, running line. And, and uh, those are available on all kinds of weights. And then mono, you know, a, a mono leader, nothing fancy here at all. This is kind of my setup that I do. Um, you know, I've got my reel and here is gel spun. There's about 200 yards of gel spun on there. And this green here is a specific type of monofilament. This, in this case, it's slick shooter. There's also another one uh, called amnesia um, that we use. And- What was the name of that again? Uh, amnesia. Oh, I forgot. Just, just in case you, you, you don't remember that one. Um, they're both really nice lines is that they don't, once you get them a little bit damp, you get them wet or stretch them out, they lose all curl. So you can really cast these things farther. So I use a loop connection here and I've got these spools of 300 grain heads and 400 grain heads and I've got up, up to 600 grain. And just like in the conventional world, when you get out to fishing um, at, at any location, especially in the Channel Islands, the current could be moving along at a half knot. It could be moving along at three knots. If it's moving along at three knots, our flies are not going to get down and we need a way to get them down. So this method allows real easily to just do a, a quick head change and, and put on a heavier line to get down further in the water column. This would now be considered old school, right? Because the, the, the integrated lines have, have become much more popular, I think. Correct, correct. And, and that's where I learned. I, I was one of the disciples of uh, Neil Taylor at UCLA when he was teaching over there. And uh, we actually didn't even have the tungsten lines like these. We had lead core. And I have to tell you, when you drop a cast with lead core, when you're learning to double haul and it hits you in the back, across, straps you across the back, you will never drop your back cast again. <laughs> it's a great learning tool. So that's our primary bait that we have there. Um, it, it's an anchovy, Pacific anchovy. So you can see there's silvery and, uh, and a better shot with this fish. It's, it's kind of a greenish bluish uh, back. And, and so that's a lot of what we're imitating up there. But again, just like trout fishing, you know, do we have to imitate or are we doing attractors? And, you know, in this case, you know, these fish over, these over here are all in the right color that are matching up into uh, what the fish are looking like, whether they're anchovies or sardines. This I tied this year um, and I'm going to try it. We get red tuna crabs that come up at, at different times. And when the red tuna crabs are up, the calicos eat them, the white sea bass eat them, everything eats them, uh, especially yellowtail eat them. And I'd like to try this and see if that'll work. This is a fly. It's kind of an interesting thing because I came out of deep sea fishing and albacore fishing, one of the hot tuna flies that we would use when we were trolling for albacore would be um, this black and red uh, feather. And in that case, it was like six inches long, but they always caught fish. And there's nothing in the ocean that is black and red, except for that, that sheep's head that I showed you, but that's not a bait fish. You I always put, do you always put a little um, um, weight in the front end of your fly? I do. I like it. But I, even this one down here has weight on it. Um, I, I find over the years, that's the one thing that I could say with a, a, a relative amount of certainty is that 
a weighted fly jigs better in the water. It's got a more act, uh, a lifelike action than when you're just stripping it back and it's just tracking straight. The fact that this will ju jump up and down makes a big difference. I think that's why even these um, uh, floating crease flies, floating uh, fished on a sinking line are the same kind of thing because if you have the patience and you let them sink down, when you strip, they're gonna dart downwards and then float back up. And, and I've caught fish on them, so it'll be interesting to see. Again, looking at um, one of our favorites in our club, Michael Pratis was out on one of our trips. This is one of the things that I like and, and learn from the conventional crowd. If you look at what he's holding, I think that color is called, a, uh, they call that the nuclear chicken. I don't, I don't know where they come up with the names of this. But again, there's nothing in the ocean that looks like that. And I've been on trips where this is the only thing these fish are eating. You know, here, here's another kind of same colors with a different version of it but it works really well. So, you know, anything that you learn from the other guys, I, I, I think that's always very important to, to adapt to what we're doing. That's, I think Marshall, that kind of goes to why we don't catch bigger fish. I, I think that's part of us learning to, to make this better and, and to figure out what, what, why they're catching fish and we're not. Oh, there's no doubt that you can learn a lot from watching a really good um, guy catch, fishing swim baits, the way yeah. that they're retrieved, the, the way that they let the, the fly works through the, the plastic work through the kelp. The, these, and you can tell that there's one or two guys who really have that nailed and dialed in. And there's other guys who just throw it out and hope for the best. Right. So it's a very, very skillful process. And yep. it's something you, you definitely, I, I like standing next to those guys because yeah. you can just copy what they're doing. No, I have to say uh, just, you know, it, it's speaking even about, you know, the charters that I do um, with, the, the other nine or 10 guys that I'm fishing with that are fishing conventional. Yeah. They will share information with each other. There's nothing about, you know, I'm not going to show you what I'm doing. And yeah, the learning experience, it does translate across any methods of fishing. And, and I'm glad that they do share that. So, but here's, you know, then th when I say with all these kind of general things, here's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, in November, when the water turned and we had scheduled a trip when we ended up fishing for whitefish, this was the number one fly. And they wouldn't take really any other color. It was green. It was green over yellow. So, you know, don't ask me why, but that's what they were eating. And this is in a deceiver without any weight on it. And they were very aggressive on this fly. Uh, squid. Uh, we do get live squid out there. Uh, it's seasonal. Sometimes we even use the dead squid for, uh, for the bait guys. And so, you know, we have to come up with our own versions uh, of, of mimicking them. So, a lot of different squid patterns out there that you could tie, a lot of complicated ones, a lot of simple ones. But again, the whole thing, like I said, is if you're fishing for white sea bass with a squid fly, do not strip that thing fast. Crawl it, you know, hand over hand. Just let it, you know, walk it in and, and they'll whack on it. Another version of this, I think this is with more soft uh in mylar. And then talk about clothing out there. Like I said, the wind, uh, we get wind out there, we get coolness out there. So I always believe in, in dressing warm, have layers. Uh, the water temperature could be 65 degrees, which means the boat's gonna be 65 degrees. So you wanna dress in layers. Um, always have a good hat. It's very important to keep the you know, sunblock to, to keep yourself uh, sheltered from that. At the other end, I, I, I'm always impressed by the guys who have the correct footwear because that's almost in some ways the most important. I know that, um, you know, flip flops are discouraged because you can definitely slide around when they're hosing down the deck. And then like, but full on boots are too hot. Tennis shoes don't quite work. Um, they're kind of, you got to really be careful with your choice of footwear I found on those boats. Yeah, it's very true. Um, you know, tennis shoes, you know, are real comfortable. And the first time they hose down the deck, you're going to be in wet feet the rest of the day. Um, I think if you go to any uh, conventional tackle shop or um, uh, marine supply, they have all kinds. They have those taller ones like you're talking about that are more, uh, you know, calf high that um, actually have good sole support in them. So they're actually comfortable to wear for the day all the way down to some that are more like ankle, but they're waterproof and, th and that does make a difference. Um, I know I didn't take a picture but Marshall doesn't like this very much. I wear what uh, he calls monkey feet, which are the five fingered um, toed uh, running shoes. And those work really well on the boats and they're not waterproof, but they dry out real fast and they're very comfortable to wear all day. I think the one thing, one thing I, I have to remind myself is that it's always colder than you think it's gonna be. 
Yes, and, and, and that's a very good point, Marshall. Thank you. Um, I, I've been out there where I've talked to guys that day at the end of the day that we were in, you know, 70, 72 degrees, you know, kind of on and off with a sweatshirt with a little breeze. And the guys out of Catalina are telling me that it's like, you know, 80 and, and they're in T-shirts. So, yeah, in just that short distance, it, it's a big weather change. Cool. I'm getting a couple of questions as we're, we're going along just on the flies. Sure. Um, Rich is asking, it's hard to tell how big those flies are there. Are they about three or four inches? Because the bait in your palm of your hand look to be about four inches. Um, they're typically, I would say, all around four inches. Four to six inches is, is, is the, uh, the average size on these. Um, Vaughn touched on this uh, last weekend that, you know, if you're tying your own flies, especially with the synthetics, you can tie your flies longer. And if you get into the situation while you're out there, then all the bait that's on board or all the bait that's in the water is, um, you know, smaller. You just get out some nippers and, and you can make them a little bit shorter. Great. How we fish when we find them. So when we find the fish, you know, this is a little bit different than uh, on the very first presentation we did with Bruce where we're using, you know, active sonar and looking for kelp patties and things like this. We're mostly fishing structure. I mean, you know, occasionally, you know, we're going to find things like this, which is a bunch of seagulls and they're not diving in the water because they think that it's like, you know, a good time for water play. That means there's bait there typically. And if there's bait, that means that something's pushing it up. It could be a school of mackerel, which we don't really care about, but it could also be a school of uh, white sea bass. It could be a school of yellowtail. So if we see a lot of bird activity around us, we will typically go investigate that. But for the most part, we're fishing with what the captain's going to do. You know, that they go onto a reef and they look at the current and they see fish on the reef and they anchor above the reef and, and they put us so that we're fishing, you know, uh, up current of the reef so that our flies or our bait are drifting down to where the fish are. Um, on the trips, on, on the boats that we're doing, like I said, this is a heavier rod up at the bow when I'm fishing with conventional guys. And, and the reason, another reason I have this, when I started fly fishing on the boats, there were not any 100% fly trips. So you're not going to be at the stern. You can't make that work. And, and I really wanted to try this. Um, I, I think I told you the other day, that after I spoke to Lefty, I was like, well, I'm going to have to try this at some point, but I still wasn't convinced. And I actually tied flies and I'd throw them out there with spinning gear and, and a weight. And I started catching fish that way. And I said, okay, so obviously flies work. Now I need to learn how to cast better. So in doing this, this is fishing up at the bow. I've got, a, a, you know, the, just, you know, in this case, it's just a, a, a big tall bucket that I keep my line in and, and casting up here, but you've got to clear these rails. And, and that makes the difference up there in, in having a heavier rod and, and you don't want to be banging that thing around there and you want to be able to get over that. So for those of you that are thinking about, gee, I might bring a fly rod on a conventional trip that I go on, or I'm thinking about dabbling this, you can go on public boats, you can go on party boats, you can go on, on charters and you could certainly fish off the bow um, and, and do things like this and experiment with it. So it's one way of doing it. And I'll show you. you. Um, I noticed it. He's he doesn't have a stripping basket, but the, I, you know, I've, I've seen like a mixture of the two. This is obviously the best deal for the bow because there's a lot of stuff to get your line caught around, like the anchor chain and the rope and other bits of pieces on boats. So this is this looks like a good bow method, but. Otherwise, you would use a stripping basket, wouldn't you? And you can always use a stripping basket. One of the reasons I do use a bucket like this is there's about three inches of water in there. Whether you're using amnesia or slick shooter, if you're not using an integrated line, the monofilament, if you keep it wet, um, you know, and, and I'm not bragging, you know, you, you know what I'm like with fishing. Uh, when I get my casting down, I can throw that thing. I can throw the 100, 100 feet of slick shooter along with 30 feet of shooting hit. That's a 130 foot cast that I can throw out there. I can't do that with integrated line, but it's really important to keep that moist in there because the downside to the uh, uh, monofilament lines is while they may be loop free because you know you can get them wet and, and keep them, they can tang they tangle up harder when they do tangle than, than the um, integrated lines. That is true. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and integrated lines are thicker and it's a lot easier to get rid of your tangle. You get a tangle with this stuff and it's kind of like, you know, eh. 
Um, so it looks like he's got a, a bit of a double hall going there. You, you probably can sit. That's an important <laughs> skill to have, is it not? Yes. These? If you're coming out there and throwing these big flies with the heavier rods, you know, that is the one thing I always encourage people to say, I want to go on one of these trips. And I tell them, you know, I've got extra gear. If you want to come out, if you want to try this, you don't have to necessarily go spend the money on things. But yes, you've got to double haul. You've got to take lessons or you've got to go to the park and practice with these things. It, it, it is just, it, it's part of really, really critical to be able to do that. But then again, to me, double haul is something that you need to do even in trout fishing. So it, it's just something to get your skills up with. Well, it's not, it's not, you need to, because you're not just dunking line over the side, like you could do on say a little, one of the longer range tuna trips. You, you, you want to cover some water and you want to, you want to get some line speed going. And uh, yeah, I can see why you would need to double hole. Yes. Right. And in this one here, in this video, this bucket here is where I keep, I'm keeping my line here. I've actually upgraded a little bit, but I'll show you that, you know, this is what it's like fishing off the bow. Um, you know, um, you're, you're, there, there's plenty of fish all around the boat. You know, it, it doesn't uh, turn into the thing that just because they're chumming at the back, that's the only place that the fish are. Um, and I had some video of me casting. Nobody wants to watch me cast, but this is the idea of why you would need to double haul up there and uh, certainly can make for an eventful day. And I, I don't think this is anything that was overly gigantic, but you know, hey, a fish is a fish. So, so it's okay. Here's, here's another good purpose for the uh, casting, the stripping bucket is you get to put your rod in something. There you go. That's about a 12 inch, 10 inch. Yeah, little sun yeah. pass. Yeah, little mm -hmm. one. Probably about 10 years old. They grow about an inch a year. So these are, are already up there. But you can see why, you know, barbless, just take the hook out, you're done. You know, put them right back and tell them to grow up, go get bigger, and you're going to fish with them next year. So that's what we do. Here's another shot. I mean, again, why the bow can be really good. And, and there's another stripping basket that we were using is a five gallon bucket. This is a deckhand, uh, George, who didn't even know how to fly fish at all. And I was like, okay, George, come up here. And I just basically showed him how to, as hard as it is with a shooting head, to kind of roll cast it out. And we had so many Benita about the boat. He got the, line about 40 feet away and and boom got it got his first fish on the fly right yep and this was taken off the bow that's my world record and that was taken right off the bow so you know i, I certainly you know yes i'd rather fish at the stern and that's going to be coming up next but you know the way if you are relegated to the bow there you're you're still going to be able to catch fish it's funny, there is a, a, a misconception that the fish are all stacked at the back end of the boat. And it, it's just, a, it's, it's strange. It's the same way trout fishermen think that the fish are all stacked against the opposite bank. You know, there's, yes. lo there's loads of these sort of mindsets that people have. It's fascinating. Well, that's, a great, that's a great analogy. I have to keep that in mind. Even when we're on the tuna trips, when they're chumming at the back of the boat and every time you throw in a bait or a fly at the stern, you're getting hooked up. Steve Pettit is notorious for this, is he'll go to the bow and start casting up there and get one fish after another. Um, the, the fish are not staying there, they're circling, they're moving around the boat. So yeah, nothing wrong with moving around there. So this video will make you a little bit crazy because they sped it up so you don't have to watch the whole thing. But this is what happens on a 100% on a fly trip when we have the stern of the boat. Um, this is also an advantage to being left hand. You see Marshall over here with the red hat and uh, this is Kevin in the orange shirt but what we do is we're going to rotate through here we take turns and and you'll see in a moment with the video and another video how how well this works um and you just cast and and after you make the cast you you move over to the left and the next guy comes in and, and takes your place like that and that's Gary over there in the corner it takes place and makes and you just keep rotating like that and if you get a fish you fight the fish if you don't get the fish then you just get back in line Works yep for, shuffle to the right shuffle to the left yes and, and in so, your case just stay in one place because you're you were a lefty yeah it's it's chore the choreography of the back of the boat it's fascinating right, right. Um, and for those of you that have done ocean fishing, by the way, it's kind of a throwback. I just had to mention this. This is kind of an interesting thing is what John does. You see these zip ties here, these colored zip ties. 
everybody has a color on the boat. And back here, John's got this gigantic ice chest that's full of ice. And when we catch fish, he puts your color through the gills and we kill the fish and throw it on ice. And so it's not sitting in the gunny sack out in the sun for the whole day. And so when you come home, you have mucky fish. It's actually pretty tasty. So got a, qu a question coming up uh, from oh. Harvey. Um, he's saying that is the island tack typically um, half half conventional, half fly, or how do how do the ratios work on that boat? It, it, it's Harvey. It's really only one of two things. It's either 100% fly, which is what I'm showing you now on these trips, and and we go with seven people at that point to to you know make it easier at the stern because we're all going to be back there, um, or uh, the conventional trips, which are we go with a total of 11. Um, and so 10 of them are conventional and there's one fly guy, which is either me. And if somebody wants to come on fly, I'm happy to share the bow and take turns at doing that, but you're not going to get as much fishing as, but, but going on any party boat, you could, you could do that on your own and just go up to the bow and fish like that. They're good. Yep, that looks good. Yes, yes. So, he, so and, and here's on this trip, you know, that we were fishing. This was in November when we were fishing for yellowtail, for uh, uh, yellowtail, for uh, the whitefish. You know, we were fishing up pretty close to the islands, and and this is what it's like on, on the boat. It's a lot less crowded. Here's yeah, Melinda. Yeah. Now, th this is using a stripping basket because when you're fishing with the 100% fly, you're moving more. I still use a stripping bucket, but you got to carry it with you. So it, it's another thing that, you know, has to go back and forth with you as, you as you're going along. But this is your typical stripping basket of, you know, making a cast and putting the line in there. So if somebody was trying this out for the first time, a beginner, do you have extra stuff like that, little stripping baskets? Because maybe a guy doesn't want to buy one just for this trip. Yeah, if somebody's going on my trip, I've got enough extra gear that I that I can outfit them to get out there. Um, usually, I'll tell them to go pick up some flies, maybe at, you know at, at the spot um, or something like that. Um, if you have an eight weight rod for these for a seven or an eight weight for these trips that are fly only, because you're at the back of the boat. Um, let me go back here for a second on that. You know, you're casting over here. You know, the person who's casting or Marshall, when you're in the corner, you're casting this way. So if the fly is going a little bit lower, it's not going to make any difference because you're not going to hit the boat. You're doing a little bit of sidearm there. So if you have, uh, you know, uh, a heavier freshwater outfit, a seven or an eight weight, that works fine. And, and most of the reels nowadays are pretty good. And even a reel that's not so good that may not necessarily have a sealed drag. If you fish it in the salt at the end of the day, you know, you take it home and you clean it up real good. And it'll be fine. I wouldn't recommend catching a yellowtail or a tuna on it, but it would be fine for this kind of fishing. Well, you know, I mentioned in my preamble that this is the least expensive, most accessible way to get into saltwater fishing. Well, arguably, maybe surf fishing is, but surf fishing gear in this game, I mean, you can, it, they're interchangeable, really. You could fish a seven weight in the surf or in a seven weight out here. So it's a easy, easy entry level. Yes, yes, um, yeah, I, I find that. I mean, you know, we always talk about the fear of, of seasickness and we've talked about that is that there's a lot of stuff, homeopathic or drugs that are on the market that really can uh, cause seasickness. And the nice thing about this trip is it's a short trip. If you're wondering if you're, see, if you're going to be seasick or if you're going to have issues with that, at least this trip is not being on a multi-day, two and a half day tuna trip where you find out on the first day you're sick and then you can't get off the boat. This is kind of like, yeah, we can load you up with Dramamine and you'll eventually get over it and then you'll go home. Great. And there she is. She uh, got her, uh, got her uh, white fish. And I think, I don't know why she's holding conventional gear. Cause I don't think she used conventional gear, but maybe she did. Maybe she went to the dark side a little bit on this. Trip. I think she, I think she should be kicked out of the Federation of fly fishers simply for <laughs> simply on the, on the grounds of that photograph. Yeah, That's well, I'll talk to her about it, but she, she doesn't, she, at least she wears good fishing clothes and a good fishing mask. So we got to give her credit yeah. on that, you know, yeah. in, in terms of those. So in terms of fishing at the back, um, this is a short video of, uh, of some things going on. Um, you know, he's made his cast, the fly's kind of down deep and you see actually hooked the fish almost straight under the boat. So he's stripping this fish in and he's putting the line right in his basket and right to his right hand side, the other guy can continue to fish and to, and to cast. And so, you know, we don't have to wait for anybody and you've got a nine foot rod and you get to go right over them like that. So it makes it pretty easy. So we can share back there and, and have these things work out. 
Yeah, and a lot of the time, you, these fish won't even get on the reel. You're just stripping them in by hand. So yeah, you're, for, you're, you're not needing it. You, you do not need a fancy uh, high tech reel. No, this. not at all. No, uh, uh, especially for uh, the calicos. Yeah, these are strippable fish for the most part. Occasionally, they'll leave, like yank the line out of your hand, but for the most part, they're pretty pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, the interesting thing, Marshall, as you say that, is you always have to be prepared because it's happened to all of us that we're fishing for calicos and you get grabbed by a bonita or a yellowtail, which are in the same area. And all of a sudden you think you're stripping the fish in and the line gets yanked out of your hand. So yeah, mm -hmm. you have to be ready for that. Here's a different kind of stripping basket and a, and a nice calico out there. Um, this is the one with the little, most of them have these little pins in it so the line doesn't get tangled. And this one, you know, it is more for surf fishing, but it worked fine out there. I mean, obviously by, you know, this guy's results, it worked okay. And he's using an integrated line. You can see how that's all set up in there. He's also using what looks like an 11 weight, super heavy two, two handle um, tuna rod. So it just, I mean, you can, you can go, you can go uh, overboard or underboard with the equipment. There's no question. Right. Like a hair with him using a foregrip, that'd be more of a tuna rod. I'm not sure that I would use that tuna rod for, for, you know, a, a calico of this size here. Right. Um, but the reason why I even show this shot is um, how aggressive these fish are. This fish is all of about maybe six inches, seven inches, and this fish ate one of those larger flies. So yeah, they're just like a typical bass, you know, that they're going to eat anything that's out there because they're a bass. That's just the way they are. And that's more of our typical stuff that we get up there uh, in, in terms of these fish. And this is something we always, we, this is a love-hate thing. You know, when you see things like this, it means the white sea bass are running and, and we're going to get out there. And this is, the, you don't see this around calico bass. This means there's a white sea bass in the area and there's schools and it's kind of exciting, but also it's not quite the serene experience of what we've had. But that's a nice calico right there. And I wish I could say that was on the fly. That's, that's on bait. Um, and, you know, this, this whole series um, has been about uh, fishing on boats. And as I'm getting to the end of it, there's one thing I did want to bring up. Uh, the Channel Islands are very, very unique. And there's a lot of us that go trout fishing and that like to go camping. And if you're not aware of it, you have opportunity to go camping on either Anacapa. Actually, I think on all four of the islands, Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel. Um, Island Packers will take you out there with kayaks. Um, you could bring your, you can rent kayaks, you could get your own kayak and there's campgrounds on the island. So you can go out there for the day or you can go out there for a three day trip uh, on something like that. And it's, it's neat. I mean, it, it's beautiful and camping's all of $15 a day. Um, you have to be prepared because yeah, you cannot go to the concessionaire. So, you know, they get wind in there. So they have these kind of campsites here that are, you know, set up for the wind, but it's, it's a way to get away for two or three days and still, and if you're in a kayak, especially you can get offshore or near shore and fish for calicos and, and white sea bass and, and yellowtail. Nice. And at Santa Rosa, especially, they have some really, really lovely beaches. Um, there is another outfitter uh, out of Camarillo that flies out there. That is not a cheap trip. You have to charter the plane. And I think it's like $250 a piece to get out there and you'd go fishing for the day. The airstrip, I think, is a mile from the from the beaches. And um, years ago in Sierra Pacific, Kazi used to do these kind of trips out there in Santa Rosa, and they get some some pretty good fish. And uh, Debbie Sharpton and I think Lou Riffle went out there one time camping, and uh, you can see just really delightful beaches. And obviously, when you compare it to our shoreline here, there's a lot more you know uh, pretty things that you could be doing out there. So yeah, you can camp and you can go surf fishing, and you got a lot of beach to fish on. So we don't get the surf perch off the boat, but it's another opportunity when you're in the Channel Islands. And finally, we have fun on the boats too. You know, we recognize birthdays and I, I put this up there because I did want to thank Marshall for the amount of time that he's put in with helping produce and, and interview people for the past uh, three weekends. And, and trust me, during the week, we've had a lot of preparation going on with all these things. So Marshall, I, I do appreciate your time on this. We'll give you another birthday cake on the next trip. Wow, that, I must have been 18 then. I can't remember that one. Gosh. I, think, I, th I think this may have been your 21st birthday, possibly. Okay. Yeah, my, my, All my, right. Yeah. We got a few questions here, Michael, because I think, is that is that the, 
Is that the end of your formal presentation? That's the end of the formal yeah. presentation. I'm going to email out the information about chartering the boat or contacting me if you want to go on one of my charters. The Fisherman Spot also does uh, similar trips on a larger boat uh, out of Catalina. And Saltwater Fly Anglers, our, our trip, whatever the name of the club is, Saltwater Fly Fishers, um, also does some saltwater trips out of the Channel Islands too. So those are, and I can send you the information on that. Okay, so we've got a few questions. Sure. Um, John Liu would like to know if you can, do you know if, whoops, somebody's just jumped over. Do you know, oh, I, I'm going to remember the question. Do you know if you can take your own boat over to the islands when you camp or do you have to use one of the boat companies for transport? In other words, can you be a, take your, drive your own boat to the islands and camp? If I don't know about Rosa, I do know that at Santa Cruz that there is an anchorage there because we see sailboats out there anchored all the time. And at the Santa Cruz, uh, I think it's smugglers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there's a pier there. So you could do that. You can't, as far as I know, you cannot anchor to the pier. And I think under the Channel Islands regulations that you have to get a permit to take your boat out there um, to actually put the boat on if you want to do that. But you'd have to check with the with the sport fishing authority with the uh, uh, state parks authority out there. But it is pretty easy. I knew I know the guys do that. Okay, another a great question here from Paul Nakamura. Can you use a switch rod? I wouldn't. Um, I guess I don't know enough about switch, Marshall, because I'm thinking of a switch more as spay. And spay casting would be really tough to do. But would a longer rod work out there? You've been out there. What do you think? Yes, you can. I would I would use a ten foot six um, six weight or even a five weight, and I would use the same line. I'd use an integrated line, maybe three or four hundred grain. And uh, yeah, you're not going to spay cast, but you can overcast overhand cast a mile. Yeah, it's a lot easier on your arm, and you're basically not double hauling either. You're just bringing out a fixed amount of line and letting it go. I would practice a bit beforehand, but a switch rod would be really good there, um, especially up in the bow. So I would say yes. Okay. Um, Bernie Ecker would like you to repeat the name of the new hybrid fish. Seems it's caught off the boat. And he, he said, do you, think, do you think they might also be living in the surf? Um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me because Bernie, because we have sand bass along the coastline. Guys get them surf fishing all the time and we get uh, calicos. So if they're breeding out at the Channel Islands, they could be breeding out here too. Uh, and the name that they call them on the boat is a Sandico. I have no idea if that's the quote, you know, legal name or proper name for this fish, or if they've come up with a uh, Latin name for it, but we call it the Sandico. Wow. Okay, Rich, Rich uh, P has, Rich Peters has a, uh, a technical question, grain weight does not equate with sink rate. Okay, um, what sink rates are you using? Type 6, T8, T11, or other? So my understanding with the T's is that a T8 is 8 grains per foot, I believe. Right, um, right. And so this is a pretty complex question. So I'll, I'll make it, I'll make it kind of short. Um, I, I, depending on the current, uh, you know, if you're fishing in still water, the heavier lines are going to sink faster. I don't know what the rates are of them, um, but that's why I have that. I'm more concerned with just keeping the fly deep into the water column. So, so doing that is fine. But t if, you, if you figure that all your shooting heads are going to be 30 feet or between 30 and 35 feet, you don't, you don't want to go shorter than 30 because they'll uh, dump on you, meaning they'll just end up in a pile when you cast them. And you don't want to go too much longer because it's hard to hold it up in the air. So if you figure a T8 at 30 feet, that's 240 grains. And then you go to T11 and, and do the multiplication all the way down the line to get up to 600 grains. There, I, I will say one thing. There's definitely... There's a, once you get really into this, if you are going to be fishing with heads, there's an advantage to learning how to make your own because you can make that head exactly the right length for the optimized casting and optimizing sinking. And it's a fine art. I don't like really, really long heads. I mean, I, I like heads 20 to 24 feet because they're manageable and it, you can get 
just like anything else with fly fishing, as my friend, my 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 friend says, fly fishing, fly fishermen can complicate anything. Yes, we, um, we are uh, we are always looking for solutions to no problems. And we we call it refining, but what we're actually doing is making it really complicated. But there's a lot of advantage to making your own heads or modifying the, the things that are there. Okay, another question has popped up. I'm trying to get there. Um, Bernie, can you use a switch rod? Okay, I'm going the other way. Vaughn Podmore. Vaughn Podmore is thanking us for hosting these. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, um, Vaughn. Uh, grain weight, sink weight. Um, Rich is also saying it doesn't look like you have um, line management devices on board, except I'm sure there's always going to be the odd um, uh, paint paint bucket. So do you bring your own stripping baskets to manage? Yes, yes, that's the one thing I always do. And if you want to use a stripping basket, like if somebody goes with me, I've got an extra one. But the simplest thing, like you said, Marshall, is a five gallon pail. I mean, it's the right. easiest, it's the easiest thing in the world, and it works fine. I graduated to using those chlorine buckets because they're taller and they're actually easier. And then I also use, um, I, I, that's, I think a Stan Placunas bucket that I was using in the picture up at the bow. And that one's even better because it's taller. They're, I think about $150 or something, but they work really well. I wonder if the paint industry knows what a great service they're doing for us. I mean, they're sure they don't. But, we could uh, probably get Home Depot to sponsor us, Home Depot or Lowe's if we start using their buckets. Well, then, then the home, then the buckets would start costing one hundred and ninety nine dollars plus tax instead <laughs> yeah. of five dollars. So, um, and Cece Rubin has a great question, which she calls the dumb question of the day, um, and it's not. There are no dumb questions in fly fishing. Um, she was looking at that huge white sea bass that was caught, and she said, "How does that not break your rod?" <laughs> and the, 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 the answer, if I might say so, is that. Uh, even a small fish can break your fly rod if you hold it up vertically or tilt it back behind you when you're uh, fighting the fish. Fighting a fish is not really something we've covered much in this, this seminar, but it's a skill that um, is very important because doing it incorrectly, you will break your rod because your rod's designed to go out either at a straight angle or even slightly down. When you start raising it up in the air, like you do when you're trout fishing, um, and then leaning backwards, which you, you you know people tend to do, you can break a rod with a with a small fish. It's not that hard. So it's not by any means a dumb question. Um, yeah, it's not dumb at all, CC. Um, it, you know, it's it's one of the things, especially if you come from the conventional world. With the conventional rods, a lot of them you can almost turn them into a U shape. And I've seen people do that with fly rods, but like Marshall said, you're running a huge risk of, of breaking them. Fly rods are designed more, and I don't know if they'll show on the screen, is the maximum is really an L to do this. So if you're fighting a fish, you're, keep, you're, you're keeping within that 90 degrees. And it's not only for the construction of the rod, but the other thing is if you lift that higher so that you're bending that you know, more like this, the rod's not doing its job anymore because all your strength is down here and, and it, it, it's just above your hand. So if you're lifting with that 90 degree bend and pulling the fish straight up, you, you're going to be fine and, and you're not going to break a rod. Yes. It's al also people think that they're going to break the tippet, but just as an experiment, if you get a piece of 10 pound test and then wrap it around your hands and try to break that by pulling it as hard as you can, you'll probably slice through your hands before you will break break the tippet. And so Correct. people are always very nervous about, and you know, they'll be fishing, say on these boats, like 15 or 20 pound test. Your chances of breaking that on a straight pool are very slight, but your chances, um, your chances of having it rub against the, the prop or rub against the, the side of the boat or rub against something else and losing your fish are much greater. So there's, um, oh yeah, we didn't mention getting your, getting your fly line caught in the prop of the boat, which I have, I am ashamed to say, done more than a couple of times. That the, that's another reason to stay up the pointed end of the boat. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have to say, I, I, I seem I remember when you got caught up and I think it's because you were thinking of something else and you had a, a knot in your basket or something. They always let us know when they're going to light up the engines. So it, it's real rare to get our lines caught in the prop. I just did it so I could buy more stuff at Fisherman's Spot. 
don't forget our sponsor, Fisherman Spot. Okay, and while we while while we're on that subject, um, we're having a drawing tomorrow on Super Bowl Sunday, and to be included in that drawing, which will be for two one hundred dollar gift certificates for Fisherman Spot, very very handy for this. So two separate prizes. You need to log on to the Southwest Council's website on and donate five dollars or more and I think you can do that either via PayPal or I, I know it's very painless to donate the five dollars and so Michael last week put up in the chat feature he put up the Southwest Council's website so tomorrow morning I'm not sure when um, but the drawing will take place we're going to do a Facebook live at 10 o'clock um before everybody gets all their Super Bowl festivities going and everything like that. So you've got until six o'clock today uh, to hit the donate button or go to Venmo and, and do it that way. And like we said, in, in $5 increments, you get a drawing ticket uh, for this thing. And uh, like Cece says, the more you donate, the more chances you get. But yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll cut that off at six o'clock tonight and there'll be all your names in a bucket and tomorrow morning I'll pick it live and uh, we'll have two winners. Great. Well, Michael, thank you very, very much for um, for this presentation. This was great, and for for the other two. And uh, I hope we can we can come up with with more similar presentations so to keep us all occupied when we're uh, when it's harder to go fishing. And it's very timely because your season season is coming up. Yes, it is. And, uh, great. Yeah, it'll, it'll it'll be a good thing. We're looking forward to that. Um, and thank you, Marshall. I appreciate all your time that you put in and we appreciate everybody who's been attending these and we hope you got a lot out of it. And if any of you have suggestions for other programs you'd like to see, especially in the salt, that's really what we're concentrating on right now. We're talking about doing a surf fishing series to cover some of the species that we have here in Southern California and some other ideas, but anything you may have, by all means, send them to us and uh, we'll go from there. Great. Thank you, Marshall. Thank all right, you all. thank you. Take care. Take care.